Hello and welcome to another episode of Attacking Third, a CBS Sports Soccer Podcast. I'm Sandra Herrera, joined today as always by my colleague and co-host Lisa Roman. We are celebrating Title IX with Title IX Tuesdays, and we're continuing our Title IX Tuesdays throughout March. And today we are very lucky to be joined by a very special guest, Sandy Brondello, basketball MVP, current head coach of New York Liberty of the WNBA. Welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm excited to have you. I know we were chatting a little bit off mic. I was like, Sandra, Sandy, Sandy, Sandra. I'm excited to chat with a fellow Sandy. Uh, we're we're celebrating Title IX here. So uh, we wanted to kick things off with uh, the, the celebration of that, the 50th anniversary of Title IX. I know playing overseas in Australia and getting your start in Australia, uh, you have maybe a different uh, playing experience, right? And then coaching experience, right? But in your own words, in your own experiences, you know, having to navigate U.S. collegiate systems, right, when scouting or evaluating. In your own words, why is uh, Title IX so important and for us to commemorate and still celebrate that today? Well, for for many, many reasons, to be quite honest. I mean, like, you know, like you said, I am Australian. So, you know, Title IX, when it came to America, obviously I learned, uh, you know, a lot about that. And it really just comes back, but the giving opportunities to women to play sport. Okay, to be involved, to have equality, to have, um, to be able to play a wide range of sports, because um, I know that wasn't always uh, available to them. And to have the similar facilities, I mean, there's so much that can go into that, but being treated the same, you know what I mean? I know the financial part, um, you know, maybe a little bit different in some situations, but you can still have the same facilities. And it's great when I get to know, obviously, coach a lot of American players and, and coming through the college system and talking to them about, um, you know, they, well, they talk to me about how great their facilities are now. And it wasn't always like that. So there's, that's a big change. Knowing that you're being respected as a female, I think that's really, really important as well. Um, but just giving opportunities to, to play, to play sport. And the more we give opportunities to females, I mean, they become role models for the younger generation. And I think that's particularly important. Um, young kids, young girls need to see and to, to see you know, people of uh, other females playing sport. Um, we want a healthy, a healthy lifestyle, and and I think now with the professional leagues that we have in America, um, I always tell all kids is you have to dare to dream because it's all possible now. Um, so yeah, I think Title um, Nine coming in uh, 50 years ago, which is. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a long time, but probably not long enough. But uh, I think uh, a lot of great things are happening and a lot of great things will continue to happen. So obviously, as a, as a female athlete and a female coach, that makes me very happy. Daring to dream. I love how you worded that. And as a role model, you are one. I mean, from your days as a player um, and, and then a coach internationally and in the WNBA, like a three-time Olympic medalist, um, uh, Australian Basketball Hall of Fame, you have so many accolades to your name. But looking back at when you started to dare to dream as a kid, how did you get into basketball? What influenced you and what kind of inspired you to pick up a ball? Well, that's a, that's a great, there's always a start for everyone, isn't it? And uh, like, I have to pinch myself sometimes to be quite honest that I'm doing what I do now um, and very ha happy about that. But look, I was, when I was younger, I was really into track and field and quite good at that. Um, Australian champion at the age of 12 and long jump. So, you know, that's where, you know, my involvement was, but um, my sister was asked to play in a, a team with some of her friends and I went along and watched and, you know, and just someone had asked me, it was a country team. I was, I was, um, you know, I lived on a, my dad's a sugarcane farmer. So I lived in the country. So rural of the city of Mackay, which at the time was about 50,000 people. And I was asked to play for, they had formed a country team and they were short of players. And to be quite honest, I can remember this is my first time playing. I just fell in love with it. And I think one of the reasons was, you know, being in track and field, it's all individual. I was a very shy kid and it was playing with my, um, you know, players that became one of my, some of my closest friends. That was fun. And I think it was just the fun in sport and going out competing um, with each other. It had a lot of special moments. 
When we're looking at your professional career, uh, playing in the WNBA, being drafted by the Detroit Shock in 1998, just the second year of the WNBA being launched previously in 1997, we're obviously doing a celebration episode here and we're talking a lot about the histories of things. So in terms of playing professionally in the States, in those first early few league uh, years of the league, what were some of your early uh, you know perceptions of the league just sort of jumping feet first in the in the in the nineties there to to sort of seeing the experiences of players now. Yeah, look for me, I I loved playing basketball. Um, you know, I was playing in the the national league back in Australia, and and then I used to go playing um, in Europe in Germany. I played there for 10 years and I was one of the first players with Michelle Timms and Shelly, Shelly Gorman to go over to Australians being recruited overseas to play in Europe. But then when the WNBA, um, you know, was formed, it, it was an excitement for all Australian players. Um, you know, we were, you know, we were obviously a very uh, competitive nation um, you know, 1988 Olympics, we finished with the fourth, uh, you know, fourth spot. 1992, we failed to qualify, but, you know, 1996 was our very first um, time that um, a basketball team had won an Olympic medal. So I think it was putting us on the stage too. And uh, Michelle Timms was, uh, she was one of the foundation players with the Phoenix Mercury in 1997. And, you know, the next year, there were so many Australians in the league, because I think um, we had put ourselves on the map there. And, uh, we like to think that, you know, we're really well-rounded, skilled players. And, um, you know, it, for me, it was just a huge excitement. It didn't matter that I went the fourth round. Um, you know, I went to the team of the Detroit Shock with two other Australians and Rachel Spawn and Carla Boyd and Nancy Liebman was my coach at that time. But I just wanted, I just love playing basketball and I wanted to play against the very best players and to test myself and and to be the best I was, not to be better than the next person beside me. And, I, to quite honestly, I had a blast. I just tried to, you know, you know, probably overplayed a little bit too much uh, with the injuries that I got over the years, but it was um, a huge excitement for me to play, being, you know, playing in the best league in the world. Um, obviously, over the years, um, you know, it's changed a lot, but in those early years, we had, like, I can remember going to Madison Square Garden and having, like, 12,000 people. And for me, that was astounding because I'm like, I'm, you know, the Olympics against USA, that's the the you know, that was a massive crowd. Um, but then going in the WNBA and playing every team, we were having so many, so much people come in and watch us. So it was a huge excitement um, for me. And I, I think, you know, obviously the league continues to grow. I think the players get better and better. And I think the sky's the limit now for the WNBA. It did start as, as something smaller. I mean, obviously it's grown today, but even as you mentioned, it was so big for you back then because you have experience from playing overseas and, and playing at the Olympics. But throughout these moments for you, these big moments for you, were you ever faced with uh, moments of discrimination because it was the WNBA or uh, you were a female playing and looking to compete at these high levels? Did you face any anything that uh, were gender discrimination throughout those times? To be quite honest, no, I did not. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I was, I suppose I was just like, you know, happy to be there at the time. You know, I'm Australian, you know, coming into to America. So um, I know other players would probably say that they had, but, you know, I had a, had a great experience coming in. And until you know some of the systems, you know, like, oh, okay, you know, you know, it's a little bit different. But back in those early days, we were all affiliated with an NBA team. So the facilities were great, you know. Um, you know, I suppose the travel was a little bit different, but I didn't know anything different back in those days. So, uh, you know what I mean? So I think that was that. I was just very, um, you know, happy to be there. But I, I am, um, you know, thankful, obviously, for the progress that we are making and will continue to make for the years to come. In those moments when uh, you were just happy to be there and you're just happy to be playing along with your friends and in front of uh, great crowds, what were you taking from those moments? What were you learning from them? Like in those, uh, you mentioned playing in front in Madison Square Garden in front of 12,000 fans. What was going through your brain as to kind of the, that point in your career and what you were experiencing? Uh, to be quite honest, I was just focused on be, trying to be the best player that I could be. Um, and, and not in an individual way, but how could I help my team and how help we can win and, and you know, play in the right way and um, trying to, to, 
you know, be better and, and learn new experiences. For me, I was just in, I was just soaking up the whole experience. To be quite 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 honest, um, you know, I loved competing. You know, that's why I played. I used to go from one league to the next. I never for ten years I never had a break, and a lot of these players still do this to this day. But um, I just loved playing. So I'd, you know, I'd go play in Europe, and then I'd play in the WNBA, and then I'd I'd fit in all the Australian. Um, commitments, Australian team commitments as well too. So, look, I was just, I just, you know, I suppose I had so much passion for the game. I just, you know, loved being on the court. <laughs> in terms of um, your your career in in WNBA, we look a lot at this now in terms of how you know whether it's WNBA or or, or women's pro soccer or what we're watching right now with the women's hockey league, how things can progress year to year. When we're looking at your WMB playing career from 98, 2003, were there moments where you were looking at how the league changed from that first year until you, you made your exit playing professionally? Yeah, I don't think it really happened during my playing career, quite honest. I think it happened in my coaching career, you know, and, and you kind of realize like, um, I, I knew, you know, just you, I just, for me, my goal is to, to, to play in the best league in the world. Like I know my very fourth round pick in 1998, I owned not $19,000, you know, but, you know, at the time I, I just loved competing, but now I know like this is our, this is our job. So I'm glad that obviously the, you know, the, um, you know, financially we're getting rewarded more, but we know we can go to another level and that, you know, hopefully that's going to happen sooner than later. Um, but for me at that time, like I said, it was, it wasn't even about the money, but, I uh, understood as it as it progressed, it was like, okay, this is my job now. So um, you know, and you only can play sport for you know a limited amount of time of your 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 life. So and that's where it came down. Okay, what was the best experience? Is that um, you can still earn a nice living, but still do something that you love. Having that as a living, and and you mentioned it, it's heartbreaking, but you can only play it for so long. And for you, after you retired as a player, you very quickly transitioned to being a, a coach. You started as an assistant coach um, in the WNBA with the San Antonio Silver Stars. At, why did you decide to coach? Was that always a goal of yours as a player? It was my passion. You know, as you, you, you know, you know, when you're nearing the end of your career, um, and obviously everyone knows that I'm married to a coach and my husband, I, you know, I would see the preparation that went into it, but this basketball is my life. You know, it was, it was my life and I knew it was what I wanted to do. And, um, I was lucky enough to, to be, um, hired on, um, at, with the San Antonio Silver Stars an assistant coach. You know, I retired in 2004 after the Athens Olympics and the next year, um, you know, had that opportunity and, and very thankful and grateful for Dan Hughes for giving me that opportunity because, you know, here I still am, you know, coaching in the best league in the world and, and, and very grateful for the opportunities that I had. And, um, and you know, it's, it's just evolved, to be quite honest. You know, I, I, um, I think it, 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 the league, I think there's the visibility that we have on our league. I think that helps and that's going to help us really continue to grow because we've got amazing, amazing athletes um, and they continue to get better and better. And this is the best of the best because, you know, there's only 12 teams and, um, and, and that's what I really, you know, I, I just love the competition because there's no easy game and, and it's a great challenge for the players and the coaches. For yourself as, as a head coach now, um, and, ha and having been so since starting in 2005, right. We're talking about as an assistant with the Spurs, but to now, you know, running things in, in Phoenix and now, you know, being tasked with, with being the head coach and with the New York Liberty, how has the league changed from a coaching perspective in the last decade, in your opinion? Is it, is it more in terms of the opportunity? Is it more in terms of the tactics? What would be your perspective on that? Oh, well, okay. Well, that's an interesting one. Okay. Look, I think coaching, um, you know, I mean, things change. I think that the league gets better and it starts with the players get better. Um, so, and that's what I really, like I really love about coaching is putting a team together and building a winning culture. Um, how can you be the best team? And it's, you know, every, every season has its ups and downs, but I think if you have that strong culture, great things can happen. But I think coaching is making sure, like you have to be very adaptable. Um, you guess the players' skill set, because you know our our goal, you know my staff's goal is is to put players in the best position so we can have success. 
and but every game is different because you, you see the talent that we have like how one team may play is different to the next team that you may play so you have to make sure that you're flexible too and in, in your game style as well too but you know I enjoy just the process of um, I'm really process driven um, you know doing the little things well but putting players in positions where we can have the most success and, and hopefully that's good enough. And when we don't, it's been able to learn from them and continually to grow because that's the experiences that we have. You know, our goal is um, to make them the best player that they are, but, you know, um, but best people too, because, you know, because it's all about, it's all about teamwork. Starting a new season uh, with New York Liberty, as you have experienced coaching before, but now you're with a new group of women and a new squad. What is the foundation you're looking to lay ahead of this WNBA season? Well, I mean, firstly, I mean, I mean, super excited. Like, you know, I've had eight great years in Phoenix and, um, you know, a lot of wonderful memories, but looking forward to, to making new memories, um, you know, with the new team and new players. Um, look, uh, you know, obviously we want to make sure we're going to be, we need to be a better defensive team. I think we, we all realize that. And I, and it's more about keeping everyone healthy. Obviously, I think last year in New York, I think they have a really good, strong culture and, and really talented roster there. Um, but continue to um, aiding to the experiences that they had from last year, building on with the continuity with the players, you know, all gelling together. But knowing that, you know, we need to be a better defensive team and being hopefully making defense create offense. I mean, that's the plan. But we got really good offensive players, too. And, and just making sure that we're playing self-lift basketball. You know, I'm all about it's it's about ball player movement, but then putting our best players in positions that they can have success and enjoying the journey together. You know, I think, you know, I think you have great people around you. You need to, this is something that we we love to do. So it shouldn't be, I, I always say, if you think it's a job, well, then you're in the wrong job. So this is our passion. So every every day coming to work, but I'm, you know, the players, I'm super excited to be coaching uh, this group. And, and, you know, hopefully we have some uh, really great success. It is all about the journey from a, from a coaching perspective, from a player's perspective. And, and you mentioned how um, as a player, it, the league has evolved and, and the players have gotten better now and how it's evolved for you as, as a coach, uh, coaching these tremendous players and, and based on the competition you have. But from the fans' perspective uh, of the WNBA and, and as women's basketball in a whole over the last decade, two decades, um, it, how has the fans' perspective commitment and interest in women's basketball evolved since your time in the sport? Yeah, look, I, I think it gets bigger and bigger, to be quite honest. And like, I think obviously social media, it's more about visibility, isn't it? I think that's kind of, you know, so you can either hate or love social media, but you know, in this, in this instance, it is good because there is a lot of fans of, of basketball and, you know, people always say it's like, you know, it's women's basketball. No, it's basketball because guess what? We're just as skilled as the men. Yeah, maybe we're not going to be dunking as much, but we play together and we play in the right way and we have incredible athletes. Um, and it's great that their stories are being put out there because they're not just great athletes. They're great people. They've got strong voices. And I think we've seen that. And I think it's just the ability. I think that we've, we've gained more popularity because people know more about us, but we still got work to do. Like we still want to make sure that we're getting, you know, um, more people to come and watch our game and look at, cause I think we have a great product. So the more the visibility that we can have, I think obviously it comes, you know, yeah, the more marketing that we get, the more money we get, the more we can grow the sport. So look, I'm really excited about, um, you know, what's going to come moving forward, but I do know in New York, we've got r wonderful owners and who are, are invested in, um, you know, making the Liberty be the best organization. And that really excites me. So I'm really, really happy and really looking forward to get to New York and get the season started. Now, being with a new group of players uh, and, and talking about is helping establish a new culture, new, new playing tactics, uh, talking, even you mentioning social media right now, probably being one of the biggest differences, right? Since your, your playing time and even the early stages of coaching. Uh, with combined with this fan interest, right? Noticing how the fans resonating with, yes, the sport of basketball, right? The the WNBA as a league, but also these players as as people, right? Which we hear so much about from coaches like yourself as well about, you know, making sure you have environments for good playing, but also good people. 
uh, what is, uh, or if there are any challenges, or how do you strike the balance of making sure that players are, uh, you know, supported in terms of these, these larger profiles, in terms of these larger platforms now, right, of social media for so many of these players who, you know, consider themselves dual activists and athletes or players who are passionate about certain uh, causes? Yeah, look, I think obviously it starts, you know, having uh, giving them experiences or helping them. And I think the L, I know the, the Liberty organization, we've got so many people that can, can direct them and help them. What is your passion? It's not just basketball. These, these, these players are way more than just basketball. And it's good now that they have those platforms continue to grow and to get their voice out there. And I think, um, you know, but it becomes a, um, you know, a group effort, to be quite honest. I think that, you know, if we're going to change, we need, uh, numbers and I think the more the people that can get out there and, and who are influential I think that that certainly helps helps the journey and that's going to obviously not just it's helping all societies not just basketball but all sport and all all females and and I talked about um, being role models because that's what we are we have an opportunity and now you see just in the, the coaching and we've got six former players as head coaches I believe um, playing in the WNBA and I think that's great because we're showing um, that's the that's the stepping stone you know it's one ends it's, your career doesn't end what comes next and I think uh, some of these players don't want to be coaches but I think just having the opportunities to be able to step into your passion and um, I think that's great um, you know you see Candace Parker you know what she's doing um, you know, obviously Sue Bird, I mean, you know, amazing. I think Diana Trussi, uh, you know, obviously strong voices and people will listen because we have we have respect and this is our time to continue to grow it. And I think it helps that our MBA counterparts um, are supporting us. That goes a long way because, like I said, there's so much mutual respect for each other and that will continue to help us grow our game. You know, let's. Uh, we've been closing out the, our, our Title IX interviews with again. It's a celebration, but we're closing them out with like a little bit of like reflective type of questions. You know, talking about celebrating fifty years is a is a hefty number. So, in terms of you know, yes, coming a long way in the last fifteen years in terms of gender equality, but we know as women, there's always so much work to be done. Uh, how much further, in your opinion, do we need to go? What are your your own personal dreams for the next fifty years? Yeah, look, oh, you know, I think that you just said it's continued to grow. Um, but can we get there a little quicker than we did in the last 50 years? I think that's, you know, we, we have to we have to set our heights high. Um, and we got to, it's like I said, you got to dare to dream, but it's, it's, it should be a reality because I think anything is possible. And, um, you know, I think we're changing per perception of the, the, the public. I think that's kind of, you know, we've got so many wonderful you know, we have a, you know, in America, female vice president. I think the more that we have uh, women in leadership roles, I think it will continue to grow. Um, the opportunities are that are out there for women. Um, so look, you know, you know, obviously we talk about financially and I just said, well, hopefully it just continues to grow. You know, will it always be the same? Will it be the same as the men's? No, but they're way older um, league than us, but hopefully we can aspire to, to get, you know, obviously bigger salaries for everyone and um, continue to, I have had more visibility on TV because, you know, it, out of sight, out of mind. But so if we can just put um, our product more out there and, um, you know, get to know some of these players, some more this personal story. So I think that's just going to help our league. So I'm excited. I'm happy to be a part of it. And hopefully I can play my part to make it, you know, bigger and bigger in these next few years and not for the next 50, but um, <laughs> but for as long as I'm in this game, I want to help it grow as much as I can. I love that. Uh, let's end on that. Watch women's professional sports, everybody. Sandy Rondello, the basketball superstar coaching legend. Thank you so much for joining and sharing a bit of your story with us. Uh, we always like to thank our listeners at the end of the episode. So thank you to our audience for joining along and listening to the show. You can follow us on Twitter at Attacking Third for more. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and anywhere you listen to your podcast shows. We're also available as video. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Visit youtube.com slash Attacking Third. And we'll be back next Tuesday with more Title IX Tuesday coverage. For Sandra Herrera, Lisa Roman, and Sandy Brondello, thank you for joining Attacking Third.